Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, and I am just excited. Once again, this is a very, very special time of year uh, for all who believe in Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. And I am just grateful for an opportunity just to share. Well, look, we're going to have a great celebration this week. Uh, started Sunday with our children. They did a marvelous job. Um, then Friday night, we're going to have the seven last words. And then on Sunday, uh, Pastor Beckley is going to help us to celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I'm excited to be here tonight. Uh, and just want to ask a question. Somebody on YouTube, if uh, if I am view, I, I, my screen is not working. Uh, I see what Pastor Beckley was talking about in the morning. If you can see me on the screen, uh, just put yes in the chat so I know that we're okay. Uh, if you can hear okay, say, I can hear. Amen. Amen. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I want to welcome you to this Tuesday night, 714 Prayer Focus and Devotion. We call it the Bible Challenge because we're taking a two-year journey through the entire Bible. And what we're doing tonight, it's like we're taking a, we're taking a rest stop. Amen. We're pulling into the rest area, but we're not going to rest. We're going to spend some time looking at Jesus Christ and what he did for each one of us. So somebody ought to say hallelujah right there. Precious Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this season. Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, Lord. So as we talk tonight, we pray that you will help us to take the next step so we're closer to you, Lord, through this season, Lord. We just thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for each one who's here, each one who's coming. And again, Lord, we thank you for our pastor, for Sister Beckley. Thank you for Ecclesia Christian Fellowship. But above all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray Amen. 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 I hope you got your handout. Uh, there's a lot of good study material in here, good material for you to go over uh, and just really, uh, really focus in during this season where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to start out by reading a verse in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, reading from the New King James Version, uh, and it reads like this. It says, that I may know him, amen, that I may know him, and that know is not just, just, you know, you read or you heard about him, but that know is talking about an experiential knowing, Amen. We want to know him. That should be our goal. That should be our aim, our purpose through this season where we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Now, listen to this. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That I may know him and the power of of his resurrection. And somebody can say a hallelujah right there. Look, we do a decent job celebrating the resurrection. Amen. Because clearly that is the power of God at work that, that something, someone who is dead can be raised from the dead. And the fact that he did it based on his love for us. He didn't have to die. The, the reason for Christ dying on the cross was for sin, to be an atonement for sin. And the way I understand that, that word atonement, if you just kind of separate it by syllables, to be at one with God. Sin separates us from God. But based on the sacrificial substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, then we can be at one with God once again. 
And that's where that's where justification is so good. I, I love the definition, simple definition of the word justification. All of us are stained with sin. We've all committed sin and that sin separates us from God. But when we are justified and justification has nothing to do with us, that's all based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. When we are justified, what, what about our sin? When we are justified, it is just as if I never sinned. And I'm telling you, that's some good, good right there. So, so we want we 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 know about the power of his resurrection. Um, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. This is the part that I want to encourage you for this week. It says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. We want to know him and the power of his resurrection, but we also want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. My, my, my. NIV says we want to know the participation of his sufferings. In other words, one of the ways that we can move higher is be by, by being taken low as we contemplate the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Amen. We should strive to appreciate, and we do that as we contemplate. And then on Sunday morning, as we focus on the resurrection of Christ, then we can celebrate all the more. Amen. I have a long introduction, uh, but that's what we're talking about. Uh, this, this is a, a, a message on the passion of Christ, the passion of Christ. Now, that word passion, uh, a definition, you know, normally we think of passion as something that's emotional, uh, something that can be intense and that kind of thing. But when it refers to Jesus Christ in a theological term, the word passion is referring to sufferings. Amen. The, the Latin word pati, uh, it means to endure or to suffer. So whenever you hear the term, the passion of the Christ is talking about the sufferings that Christ went through. And so that part, that way we can, we can fulfill Paul's desire to know Christ to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, the participation in the sufferings of Christ. That's what Passion of Christ is all about. That great movie by Mel, uh, Mel Gibson, it was talking about basically the week that he suffered. My, 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 my. So, so there's a simple outline and, and our focus this, this year uh, as we look at the passion of Christ, we are focusing on Luke chapter 22 through chapter 24. Tonight, we're only going to talk about 22 and 23, and we'll get our celebration of 24 on Sunday. Amen. But I, I encourage you, I encourage you, as much as you are physically, emotionally able to embrace the suffering that Christ went through. And, and I say to the extent where you take some time and try to place yourself in his shoes or in his sandals, whatever, whatever applies, but try to place yourself there. And as, as, as much as is humanly possible, try to experience experience what Christ experienced as he went to the cross. Now, obviously, we can't experience what he experienced on the cross. But when you look at the conditions that he went through, chapter 22, verse 1 through 6, 
uh, Christ went through trials and crucifixion. Now, the trials that he went through, I want you to picture this. Who, my, 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 my. When, when Christ was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and I want to read the outline because the Lord, the Lord just blessed me to have a good time with this to, this morning. Um, there was an agreement to betray. So we have we have a young man who was one of the followers of Christ, and he chose to betray. Jesus Christ. In other words, the, the religious leaders that hated Jesus and wanted him off the scene offered money to one of Jesus' disciples to let us know where he is and where we can grab him. And where did that take place? Lord have mercy. That took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus Christ went to the garden to pray. He knows that this moment is coming. He knows this is going to be intense. He knows he doesn't have to do this. He doesn't have to go through this. But it was his love. It was his love. I remember Phil Hawkins, uh, the late Phil Hawkins, great singer for Ecclesia for many years. He used to always say it wasn't, you know, what, what was it that kept Jesus on the cross? It was the love that he had for us. The reason Jesus went to the cross is because he loved you and he loved me that much that he'll go through whatever he had to go through in order that we might have a relationship or the right to a relationship with Jesus Christ, have a relationship with the Father. And Jesus paved the way for us to have that relationship with the Father. So if you can imagine, he wasn't betrayed by those who hated him. He was betrayed by one of his chosen. Figure out what that feels like. Think about that. Contemplate that. And then when, when, when did all of this kind of transpire? Um, so there was an agreement to betray but it happened the last supper of the day. Jesus has set up a special time to meet with his disciples. Uh, he knows that this moment is coming and he's, this is the last time that he's going to have to spend with them in a peaceful environment. It's getting ready to get crazy. And so he has this last supper. And even at the last supper, Jesus makes some announcements. He, 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 after spending this time in prayer, he took three disciples with him and, and asked them to pray with me. Can you imagine somebody, your leader, ask you with, with intense fervor to pray with me? And all three of them fell asleep. My, 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 my. And then they had his last supper and everything was planned. It was arranged. It was special. And Jesus makes the announcement that somebody's going to betray me. One of you, not somebody, one of you is going to betray me. Oh, my, 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 my. And they all look around like, who is it? Who is it? And then somebody said, is it I? You know, nobody thought that Jesus would be betrayed, but yet he was. And, and then, you know, again, in the, in the garden, he prays even more fervently. And while he's praying, while he's praying, the one that made the agreement, whew, my, 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 he comes with the Jewish leaders and soldiers to arrest one man, Jesus. And it's just incredible. It's incredible. I talked about this, I think, last week. Um, it's, it's so incredible. They had the Roman art. Romans were known for a show of force. Now, I don't know if these were Roman soldiers. I think they were probably just soldiers, you know, Jewish soldiers um, that reported to, to the high priest and, and that sort of thing. But it was over 400 of them that came to arrest one man. They learned something from Rome. They learned if you outnumber big enough, then you won't have a scuffle 
as a result. So, so, so they had, they had, you know, these, these 400 soldiers and the religious leaders and the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, they all came to arrest Jesus. My, 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 my. And it's, it's so beautiful in John, it doesn't say it in Luke, but in John, they asked him the question, are you Jesus? And he responded with the term that Moses used uh, or, or God used when he was talking to Moses at the burning bush. Jesus said, I am. Now you're talking about the power of God. When Jesus said, I am, all of those 400 soldiers, the, the Jewish leaders and the betrayer, the, the, the scripture says that they all fell over backwards from the power of God. Now, that would have that would have triggered something in me, I think. That maybe, maybe, maybe this might not be the one to mess with. But yet, after that display of power. And, and, you know, look, it says that, that Peter pulled his sword and tried to cut off a man's head. Uh, he missed and cut off his ear. Jesus actually healed the man's ear, the one that came to arrest him. Jesus healed his ear. That would be a second thing that would cause me to pause a little bit. But they were so bent on, you know, doing what they, they had to follow orders. The, the Jewish leaders were not impressed at all. So they're going to go on. And so they arrested Jesus. So we have an agreement to betray. We had the last supper of the day. We have prayer to make it today. And then there's a rest that ruins the day. They took, took Jesus. And, and, and after Jesus was arrested, Peter, one of his, one of his inner circle three, one of the ones that was known, you know, to be boisterous and vocal and stated that he loved Jesus. And what did he do? He denied Jesus three times. He, 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 number one, he left Jesus. He didn't stay with him after Jesus was arrested. Yeah, he pulled his sword. He tried something that didn't work. So now he's out. You know, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm gone. But he stays close because he wants to see what's going to happen. And while he's there, you know, outside, there's a fire going and they're trying to keep warm. Everybody's trying to keep warm. So, so Peter walks up and he's trying to warm himself up a little bit. And somebody says, aren't you one of those that followed that Jesus? And three times he denied him. He denied Jesus. And when he denied him, the third time, it says that there was a cock that crowed and Peter was in eyesight of Jesus. Jesus looked at him because Jesus told him that you're going to betray me. And Peter's like, no way. My, my, my. So how would you feel? Betraying Jesus at a time where, you know, if he ever needed you, that was a time. Now, listen to this. And so while after he's been arrested, Peter denied him, then they're, they're mocking Jesus. So arrest that ruins the day, mocking Jesus? No way. Yes, they did. They're slapping him. They're beating him. They're, they're whipping him. They're doing all kinds of things uh, as a result of this trial. And there's no reason for him to be on trial. He's done nothing wrong. But the hatred that these Jewish leaders had for Jesus, the source of their hatred was the hatred that the devil has for God. So if Jesus is the Messiah, if the, you know, the devil's thinking, if, if I can kill the Messiah, then there'll be no salvation for anybody. Oh, this plot gets so thick, so thick. So, so they're mocking Jesus. And then in one part of the trial, Jesus actually went through seven trials. The trial started at night and it went all the way up. 
he he went through and through. Look, when when we talk about justice, you know, when we talk about how we're supposed to have a right to a fair trial, um, a right to to you know uh, answer our accusers, all that, all of that's thrown out the window. This is all seven illegal trials that Jesus went through. And so in one of the trials, again, there's no, no accusations uh, that are, are truthful. Uh, there was one, one where they actually sent people to lie about Jesus. So those charges would stick and they, they, that didn't work. So then it got to the point, uh, in, as a matter of fact, I will read that in, in Luke chapter 22, um, starting at verse... Let me see. Let's start at verse 66. Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 66. And I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, it says, at daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together and Jesus was led before them. Here's what they said. If you are the Messiah, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. My, my, my. They all asked, are you the son of God? Jesus replied, you say that I am. Again, he's using those words, I am, to point them back to God's conversation with Moses. And then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. And from there, the crucifixion was, was really set in motion. Amen. They hung him on the cross. Hanging the, the, the Romans, the Romans perfected torture and they perfected the process of execution. And so Jesus hung on the cross the Roman way. What was the Jewish way? If he was guilty, uh, according to the law of Moses, there was a penalty. That penalty would be to stone him to death. But because the Jews did not have power because they were subject to Rome, then it was not possible for them to execute anybody. So they had to, from that point where Jesus made the confession that he, that I am, you know, he's, he's confessing himself to be God, then the Jews have to play, they have to play chess now. They, they have to position some things so Rome would declare that Jesus is worthy of death. And how did they do that? They began to say how Jesus was against Caesar. And all of that kind of foolishness went on uh, to the point where Rome gave the oh, go, go ahead for Jesus to be executed. That was the Roman way. So then when we get to chapter 23, and we, we've skipped a lot, but when we get to chapter 23, verse 44 through 46, I want to read that for you. It says, now it was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the morning, three in the afternoon, uh, for the sun stopped shining. The sun stopped shining. The sun stopped shining. At noontime, darkness came upon the whole land at until three in the afternoon, the sun stopped shining and the curtain in the temple was torn in two. My, my, my. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Whew. When you look at all that goes on, the, 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 the curtain in the temple, the curtain in the temple was thick. And it says it was torn in two. There's other scripture that talk about an earthquake. Uh, there's all kinds of things that happen. And but verse 47, 
this is something we need to realize. The centurion, the centurion, that is the commander of a Roman legion of 100 or Roman Roman um, battalion or whatever it is. Uh, but there was he was he was a commander of 100. It says the centurion seeing what had happened. Praised God. And said, surely this was a righteous man. My, 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 my. So somebody, somebody recognized who Jesus was. The Jewish leaders who supposedly studied the Old Testament scripture that talked about the coming of Messiah, they didn't see it. The scribes that spent all of their time in the scripture, they didn't see it. The Sadducees was a sect that, that they didn't see it. And the Jewish people, for the most part, didn't see who Jesus was. But the centurion, a Roman, a Gentile, said, surely, when you look at how the, how, how the darkness covered the land, how the sun stood still. You look at, at, at how the, 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 the curtain in the temple was torn in two and how the earth quaked. Something supernatural was going on because this man who just died was a righteous man. My, 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 my. And why is it so important that Jesus was righteous? Jesus, according to John chapter 1, verse 29, John chapter 1, verse 36, uh, John the Baptist, when Jesus came on the scene, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So for Jesus to be take away the sin of the world, he had to be a lamb that was sacrificed. And not just any kind of lamb, he had to be a perfect lamb, unblemished, unblemished, unstained with sin. And Jesus was exactly that. My, 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 my. And so when Jesus died, what he did is he paid the price for sin that none of us could pay. No, we could not pay the, the price that was required. The only thing, the, you, if, if God had given us what we deserved, you know what, what, what God would have given us? He would have just given us a sentence. We would have found ourselves in hell and, and suffer punishment forever for what we did against the law of God. But when Christ died on the cross, he died in our place. In other words, Christ died so we don't have to. We talked about it earlier, that forgiveness of sin, that justification means it's just as if I never sinned. And so when God looks at us, he looks at us as if we had never sinned. Why? Because he sees us, even as we went through the Passover Seder uh, last Friday, and the, and the speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Brother Savarese, talked about the Passover, going all the way back to Exodus chapter 12, says that when you put the blood of the sacrificed lamb on the sides of the doorposts and on the top, then when the death angel comes by, when he sees the blood, he'll pass over because we are covered by the blood. Today, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are covered by the blood. And God sees the blood of Jesus that's been applied to the doorpost of our lives. And he passes over us when it comes to death. 
But what's so beautiful is what not 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 what's happening outside. That's a beautiful thing that he passes over us. What happens on the outside is beautiful. But also when you read Exodus chapter 12, there was a lot of instruction for what was supposed to take place on the inside. Amen. In my heart, the spirit of God is at work in my heart. The, the Lord is working some things to, to make me better, to make me put me, keep, keep me on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I'm telling you, when it comes, when we look at the suffering that Jesus went through, there's a lot that we can appreciate if we spend the time to contemplate what Christ went through for us. He died to pay the price for sin for us. And then after he died, he was buried. It says he was buried in a, and he was placed in a borrowed tomb. And, and it's amazing, even while he was there, it was just temporary. And that's the, that's, the, that's the beauty of Sunday morning, what we call Easter Sunday morning. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is so beautiful because Christ did not stay dead. He rose from the dead. And I, and I encourage you, and I'm going to stop right there, but I, uh, on, the, on the first sheet of our handout for this week, uh, there are three songs that I encourage you to listen to. He Died and He Rose by Uncle Reese, beautiful song. No Greater Love by Fred Hammond shows us the love of Christ and what he did in our life. And then on Sunday morning, I encourage you to listen to Jesus is Alive by Ron Kenobi. And then there's an article from dot que or gotquestions.org. Why was Jesus crucified? So spend spend the week, spend the week just going through. And each time, each day, we'll be reading. Starting tomorrow, uh, we'll be reading a, a passage from Luke chapter 20 through through 24, and we'll do that all the way up until the weekend. And there's some exercises. Spend some time on those exercises. Dig in. Look, we want to know Him in the fellowship of his suffering. Philippians chapter three, verse 10. Look, we wanna, we wanna know him, we wanna know the power of the resurrection, and we wanna know the fellowship of his suffering. So I encourage you to spend some time this week, uh, set some time aside, you know, 15, 20, 30, however much time you can, and just set it aside and just, just dig into these scriptures and allow the Lord to work on the inside of you because your outside is already covered by the blood, but God is still working on the inside for you to be closer to him day by day. And with that, we'll stop right there. I encourage you, if you're able to come out on Friday night to Ecclesia, come on out. Uh, hopefully, it'll be live streamed as well. But the seven last words will give us a good picture of that. And then on Sunday morning, it's going to be the hallelujah resurrection, uh, knowing the power of, of, of his resurrection. We, we want to spend that time worshiping. And bring friends, bring somebody with you. Amen. Even somebody who does not know Jesus, it's a perfect time for them to get to learn about our Jesus Christ who loved them even as he loves us. So with that, we're going to stop right there. And I thank you again for joining in uh, for the Bible challenge. And remember, keep reading. God bless you. We'll see you next time.